Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan and my guest today is Dr. Shahida Abdali, Ambassador of Afghanistan in Delhi. You've been here five years, uh, a familiar face to many of us who deal with uh, India-Afghan relations and Indian foreign policy. It's a great pleasure to have you on Rajya Sabha TV. Pleasure is mine. Thank you. Let's start, Ambassador Abdali, with um, a broad review of the current security situation in Afghanistan. Uh, from time to time, we know that the Taliban, ISIS, have been active. They've been uh, quite terrible terrorist attacks uh, in different cities. How would you assess the current scenario in terms of the ability of the Afghan National Security Forces to deal with the threat that these terrorist groups are posing? Well, there are two ways to describe the current situation. One, uh, are we done with the challenges? No. Are we dealing with the challenges effectively? with the uh, planning and the strategy in place, we try our best to deal with the challenges that we face. But uh, to be frankly uh, speaking, uh, we are uh, facing security problems in Afghanistan and as a region uh, altogether. Uh, terrorism has been changing its, uh, you know, its, uh, you know, its phase uh, in terms of its uh, uh, activities in Afghanistan, from the Taliban to Al Qaeda, and today we hear of Daesh. Uh, but we are trying our best to deal with the challenge effectively. But if you ask me if Afghanistan can alone handle the situation uh, the way we are facing the problems, no, not at all. Afghanistan will not be able to deal with the problems or the challenges uh, alone effectively. Therefore, uh, uh, the fact that this problem that we face has a regional dimension, dimension and a global dimension. We need uh, as a region to act together, first at the region level and at the same time to deal with the Western world, uh, who are also a partner with us in terms of dealing with the problems of terrorism together, that we also collaborate uh, with them to uh, deal with the problem in a manner that will take us towards our desired results. Um, if we break down the um problem itself into different components. You mentioned the regional uh, or the external dimension, and, we, and we'll come to that in a second, but how would you assess the training level and the motivation level and the uh, ability of the different elements of the ANSF to deal with these challenges, uh, the, the, the army, the police? Um, uh, one has heard uh, some words of praise from um, Indian officers, Indian diplomats, as well as Western officers and diplomats who have interacted with the uh, ANA and the police, uh, uh, but also a sense that a lot more needs to be done. How would you rate mm. their effectiveness as a fighting force? Well, first of all, uh, uh, in order to deal with the problems that we're facing, uh, we should not focus on only on the military aspect of our uh, prepare, preparation and, and, and the fight against it. We are trying on two levels, a political uh, solution to the problem and military at the same time. Politically speaking, Afghanistan, as you know, has been asking for a political solution uh, at the regional level and also at the bilateral level with some of our neighbors, uh, mainly Pakistan. Uh, but unfortunately, we have not been able to um, see a tangible result in our effort to bring peace politically uh, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, terrorism uh, the way we see it unfolding in Afghanistan. But at the same time, Afghanistan, as any other country, will need strong army and uh, strong police in order to deal with the problem effectively. Afghanistan uh, has been trying hard to build its army, a full-fledged army, uh, with full equipment that they require, uh, which we do it uh, in cooperation with the Western countries or partners with NATO and the US, and they are helping Afghanistan uh, in various capacities. But currently Afghanistan is focusing on air capability because um, uh, you cannot handle a situation without uh, the air power that is needed in Afghanistan. Especially and airlift and air ability lift, to exactly. strike. Uh... Absolutely. And currently Afghanistan has a four-year plan for strengthening the NSF. Uh, that involves our uh, relationship, our contacts with a number of countries in the region and beyond this region. And India is one of those countries. Uh, India has helped Afghanistan, uh, and we will continue to seek assistance from India and other neighbors of Afghanistan 
and beyond uh, this region to help Afghanistan uh, with the uh, needed assistance uh, militarily. Equipment, training. Training yeah. equipment, enhanced training, and, and that's going on. Uh, in fact, we are looking into increasing the number of uh, training programs in India. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have been asking for, and this I'm, I'm sure will happen in the near future, uh, to increase uh, at least 50% of our training program. What is the current scale of uh, Afghans getting trained in India? Is there a we, number? You see, it depends. Uh, the number varies. At times we have average 300 at a time in, in India. Uh, more than uh, 4,000, around 4,000 trained already in India. So we are increasing the number. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, since uh, is handling the situation almost entirely on its own, uh, the foreign troops have left Afghanistan. So the burden is almost on the Afghan uh, security forces. Uh, now there are some foreign troops still in Afghanistan. So because of the entire responsibility on the shoulders of the Afghan National Army Security Forces, we need to strengthen our army more than any time uh, before. And we are exactly doing that right now. Right, with the focus on air power to begin with anyway. Um, you mentioned that uh, uh, military means is not the only um, approach that the Afghan government is pursuing. Uh, we know that for the last, perhaps as long as a decade, uh, the Afghan government has been trying to explore the possibility of dialogue. There's the, the, the uh, High Peace Council. Uh, there have been sporadic contacts with the Taliban. Uh, the Taliban have not been the best of negotiating partners. You've had meetings with them where they have read out messages from Mullah Omar, and Mullah Omar had died by then. So it's not clear at what level and with what sincerity the Taliban has, uh, have participated in these contacts, but uh, is your government still committed? Do you still see that there is value in pursuing a negotiated settlement with the Taliban, or do you think the Taliban are simply buying time, are simply um, uh, you know, waiting for the external scenario to change so that then they would step up their, uh, their, their uh, you know, military or terrorist campaign against your government? Well, Afghanistan's commitment is undoubted. And we have, a lift, we have left this choice to the Taliban and their supporters that Afghanistan would be very happy to deal uh, with the uh, conflict right now uh, politically and resolve. But at the same time, that also does not mean that Afghanistan will be totally depending on uh, the political outreach. Afghanistan is doing its best to, uh, to deal with the challenges politically. Uh, we have given this option to the Taliban and their supporters. Uh, we are trying our very best to, with our neighbor, Pakistan, to bring the Taliban to the negotiation table as they do uh, talk about their influence and the reality on the ground is that they are living uh, in Pakistan. So we hope that they will help uh, bring the Taliban to the negotiation table so that we resolve the problem politically. But at the same time, if that doesn't help, Afghanistan will never uh, compromise on its rightful conditions when it deals with the uh, challenges uh, in, in the context of terrorism. Uh, both under President Karzai and under, of course, President Ashraf Ghani now, the Afghan government has insisted that the Taliban abide by uh, so-called red lines when it comes to negotiations. For example, they must accept the uh, validity of the current constitution, uh, the importance of, uh, of elections and democracy, rights of women. Uh, do you feel that the Taliban uh, have really agreed to accept those conditions or uh, do you feel that uh, theirs is an entirely tactical game and that they have no interest whatsoever in sustaining some of these uh, uh, accomplishments that Afghanistan has made over the last decade and a half? Well, you see, as I said earlier, uh, we have left these options. Afghanistan will never uh, uh, bypass the red lines that we have set forward um, uh, uh, for them to accept and then uh, be part of the political process in Afghanistan. But uh, more, more significantly here, it's the issue of the states uh, that they uh, should deal with. Uh, I think if uh, states and neighbors, the neighboring countries, the neighboring countries yeah. when they join hands and they support the Afghan peace process sincerely, and I will see no reason uh, for a continued uh, war against Afghanistan in the name of the Taliban. Uh, in fact, it's more to do with the states 
that deal with the problems rather than the non-state actors who have support in the states. Uh, any indication of when the next contact or meeting or negotiation with the Taliban might take place? We continue to engage. Uh, we have a mechanism called quadrilateral uh, that, frankly speaking, has not uh, you know, given much. Uh, currently, uh, there is a new uh, uh, you know, activity that you can see in the region, uh, especially uh, led by Russia. The six party. The six party, yeah. and then that will be, be added uh, in terms of the 12 party talk uh, in the near future. So the Central Asian countries, uh, for, the for the benefit of our viewers, I'll just explain uh, that uh, this is Russia, Afghanistan, China, Pakistan, India, Iran, and, the and then you'll add the, the six Central Asian yes. countries. So this is going to take place, and that is also for the sake of uh, peace uh, in Afghanistan. We hope that uh, these uh, meetings uh, will help Afghanistan uh, bring about a change. And we very much hope that, as I said earlier, that uh, resolving the Afghan conflict is not in the hands of individuals uh, uh, or the Taliban that we, that we hear from time to time. It's a solution that is in the hands of uh, countries in the region, states, governments. We hope and that under, in, in these forums that we reach a conclusion uh, that uh, it's no longer uh, uh, you know, a policy or a strategy to use terrorism as a tool against neighbors. You mentioned the, the quadrilateral uh, group, the QCG. It um, had, uh, there was some optimism that this would be a forum or a platform to resolve some of the big issues, but it never went anywhere. Uh, why do you think that the new format, uh, uh, the six-party talks or the 12-party talks, has a better chance? Do you see the inclusion of India and Iran and the Central Asian countries as uh, an important element uh, in, the, in, the, in the negotiating table insofar as this may bring greater influence on, say, a country like Pakistan? Is that, is that the... You see, um, as I said earlier, uh, countries of the region should know that uh, the problem in Afghanistan is much bigger than uh, speaking of uh, one or two or three countries. Right. It is going to uh, pose challenge as it has already to everyone in the region. Therefore, uh, it's high time that the entire region get together for the sake of everyone in the region, whether these are Central Asians or South Asians or, or, or others in this region, uh, you can see the spillover effects of Daesh and other terrorists uh, beyond Afghanistan. So that should mean that uh, it's not entirely related to one or two countries uh, to deal with the problem, but uh, a, re a regional uh, phenomena that we should deal effectively together. So uh, adding more countries, I think, should result into an understanding and also uh, pressure uh, uh, against uh, those who don't help, don't, don't assist in, in, in the genuine and, uh, and, and sincere effort that we all seek. So we hope that a wider engagement of the region will result, uh, unlike uh, we have had so far the mechanism including the quadrilateral. One of the concerns of uh, officials in India and Indian analysts, and I think uh, people in Kabul too, is that the, the new arrangements, the, the six party and the 12 party talks, and the meeting which preceded it of Russia, China, Pakistan, is driven in some ways by a sense that Daesh is the main threat in Afghanistan and the region. Now, while this may be true for, um, of course, Syria and Iraq, uh, this may be true of other parts of West Asia, um, it's still not clear that in Afghanistan, the world can afford to take its eyes off the Taliban and focus only on the Daesh. But there is a sense that the, the Moscow meetings have been driven by this, by this fear that we need to uh, pull together to deal with Daesh. And even if this means uh, compromising with or softening our stand on the Taliban, then so be it. How do you respond to this kind of an assessment or this I, kind of uh, analysis? I, I very much agree with you that the terrorism that we see in the world are not all the same. Uh, the terrorism in Syria and the terrorism in Afghanistan and the region are quite different uh, from, from one another. Um, therefore, uh, in my opinion, uh, that uh, 
it's not the individuals, it's not the entities that we talk about. It is, in fact, the state sponsorship of terrorism. That is the biggest challenge. You may see it in various forms, in various ways uh, in the region, as we have seen in the last uh, two decades, uh, being named as this and that. But in reality, these are all uh, coming from the same sources. Uh, the Daesh in Afghanistan is, 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 is made of the same old uh, entities that we knew and we know as the Taliban or the GTP or other types of terrorists. Therefore, it has only changed its, its outlook. Uh, it has changed the flag from white to black. That is the change. So in my opinion, we in the region should focus more on the state sponsorship of terrorism, which is the main challenge. And this will keep changing uh, uh, in the future as well. So the Daesh in Syria, as you are right, uh, that some of the countries are driven only by the uh, fact that Daesh is its main challenge. Therefore, they should come, come together. But yes, on the surface, you can see that. But in reality, it's much deeper and much more complicated. You mentioned state sponsorship of, of terror. And I know that both the Afghan government and the government of India have repeatedly pointed fingers at Pakistan. Uh, we have a problem with the sponsorship of terrorist groups uh, like the Jaish e Mohammed or Lashkar e Tayyaba or Hezbul Mujahideen that stage attacks uh, on the Indian side uh, inside Indian territory. Uh, you have a problem with the Taliban, with the Haqqani group, others that use safe havens or sanctuaries in Pakistan to uh, strike in, inside Afghanistan. And we've seen deadly, horrific attacks that have been traced back to, to some of these elements. When President Ashraf Ghani uh, got, got elected, there was a sense in which he tried to reach out to uh, the Pakistani government, and in particular to what everybody knows are the, the main, the, the establishment of Pakistan, which is the military. He even uh, visited the GHQ in Rawalpindi, something that heads of state normally don't do, uh, as a gesture of his desire to have a new beginning. Uh, do you feel, uh, looking back over the last three or four years, that there's been any change in the uh, Pakistani attitude towards, Afghans, towards Afghanistan's uh, security concerns, or is it business as usual, really? Well, Afghanistan and India, as civilized nations, will always uh, reach out uh, to their neighbors for a peaceful living. And we have done so. Afghanistan, if, if you've seen it in the last at least 15 years or 16 years since the uh, government after the Taliban, each government uh, did its best to resolve a problem with all of neighbors, uh, mainly with Pakistan. Uh, coming, uh, coming in the context of terrorism, um, a number of visits took place when President Karzai was uh, president, and later on when President Ashraf Ghani took over. He followed, uh, did much more than the previous government. But frankly speaking, uh, things have not changed. In many instances, it has, it has got worse uh, compared to uh, years before. You can see much more terrorism in Afghanistan and in the region compared to the previous years. Therefore, um, uh, we hope that, uh, that uh, all of us will uh, look into uh, the result of terrorism uh, that will not only be applicable uh, in terms of the negative uh, you know, effects in the, re in the in own countries, that they will be only uh, Afghanistan, India, or some others will be affected. But everyone eventually, and you can see uh, incidents or uh, terrorist uh, incidents taking place in Pakistan. You can see uh, only people being uh, suffered because of terrorism. So we hope that uh, given the background, given the uh, past, uh, that terrorism uh, or the terrorist group will, will have no friends and they will strike against anyone, including the perpetrator, uh, that, that we will end uh, the policy uh, to use terrorism against its neighbors. So the Pakistani response to, this, uh, to these charges that Afghanistan lays and that India has been laying is that, oh, we ourselves are victims of terror. They point to various incidents that have happened and there's no shortage of them. We saw the attack on, in Sehwan Sharif on the Sufi Shrine, Army Public School in Peshawar a couple of years ago. Again, deadly, deadly attacks. And uh, they have pretty much explicitly and repeatedly tried to say that the terrorist groups that are responsible for these acts have sanctuaries and safe havens in Afghanistan. They say that the TTP, just like the Afghan Taliban is sheltered in, in Pakistan. They allege that the TTP 
has uh, the tacit backing or the sheltering of the Afghan government. How do you respond to these allegations? Have they ever shared evidence of this that, uh, uh, or um, you know, uh, provided proof of these allegations? I mean, how do you respond to, to this charge? Well, unless someone says the milk is black, um, I wouldn't go into the details of how terrorism is defined and who's uh, you know, sponsoring it and where it's coming from. Um, Osama bin Laden was not found in Afghanistan. Blaumar was not killed and found in Afghanistan. Uh, Mla Mansour was not found and killed in Afghanistan. So we can make up uh, of why uh, and where terrorism uh, is being uh, nurtured and, and, and still exists. So I don't want to go into the further details of, of the uh, use of terrorism, the sanctions that exist, and the political motivation behind the use of terrorism. All I would say is that, uh, that uh, whoever blames uh, Afghanistan uh, will simply mean uh, nonsense to everyone. Because especially, since country, we, especially since TTP and Daesh are coming together, and we know that Daesh is attacking targets in Afghanistan, so the idea that you would be backing one section so it's, um, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's, it's how come uh, one would blame it on Afghanistan, a country having suffered for decades in the hands of terrorism, will be, will be supporting terrorism. I mean, uh, it's out of question. Uh, if one would just simply respond and, uh, you know, uh, trying to evade, evade from questions, that's another, another issue. But the ground, the fact of the matter is that, uh, that Afghanistan is the biggest victim of terrorism. And, uh, and we are not going to be alone in this. We have been telling everyone that, uh, and we hope that countries in this region, we can see a realignment. You can see a new relationship being established in the name of war against terrorism. We hope that this becomes an opportunity, uh, not another beginning of a continued and long war uh, in Afghanistan and, and by extension in the region. Uh, we hope that major countries in this region, especially India, Russia, China, Iran, and others uh, will uh, go a path uh, that will not be, uh, you know, a misguiding, uh, you know, uh, approach in terms of the war against terrorism. That we, from now on, should deal with this problem more effectively and in a much different manner. So far, unfortunately, uh, politically, we have been engaging each other, but the result on the ground. Um, we don't see, on the country, we see much more violence, much more terror. Are you concerned that given the rise of Daesh and given the uh, improved relations between not just China and Pakistan, which has been, they've had excellent relations for decades, but even Russia and Pakistan, that this is in a way giving Pakistan more room for maneuver, more space, uh, and that the likelihood of Pakistan addressing your concerns is getting reduced? Well, that's what I, I uh, implied earlier. Uh, that we can see uh, you know, realignments in terms of relationships. Which are not helpful and, necessarily. And yeah. if we hope that these realignments will result in peace, not in continued war. Uh, we, we, which we hope that we will not give further room to the state sponsor of terrorism. We hope that we will not uh, uh, you know, lift you know, the pressure uh, out of countries uh, who, have been, who have been misleading uh, not only our region, our countries in this region, but uh, the world. Ambassador Dali, uh, we don't have too much of time, but one aspect that we haven't spoken about yet, and I would like your thoughts on this, is uh, the policy of the United States. One element of uncertainty, as it were, in the region is we simply don't know how U.S. policy towards Afghanistan will evolve. President Trump is an unknown quantity in some ways. However, General McMaster, uh, you know, he... General Mattis, they've had experience dealing with Afghanistan, they've had experience dealing with Pakistan. Based on contacts that your government has had so far with the Trump administration and your own assessment as a diplomat, how uh, do you see U.S. policy towards Afghanistan evolving? Well, U.S. is, is an important partner uh, for Afghanistan and for the region because the U.S. has invested a lot in the war against terrorism, um, and the U.S. still has forces in Afghanistan, it has been affected by terrorism. There's a new administration, and uh, of course, it's still in the making, uh, especially in terms of the uh, new appointments and the review uh, on the war against terrorism that is taking place right now in, in the U.S. 
the early signs uh, you know, indicate uh, or tell us that they are serious. Uh, as you have heard President Trump uh, speaking of the war against Daesh and other terrorist groups, uh, we hope that we translate this into actions. We translate this into an, a much more uh, you know, result-oriented uh, strategy in the region. Uh, so far, uh, as you also know, that we have not seen um, you know, a strategy that uh, deals with the details of the way forward as to how we are going to be fighting differently uh, or dealing with the problem of terrorism different from the previous 15 years. The few previous 15 years, we can see, did not give us much in terms of the peace and stability that we've always uh, you know, struggled for. We hope that based on the failures of the last 16 years, we will review, we will revisit our approaches in a manner involving countries who are sincerely uh, and who are sincere in the fight against terrorism, uh, that they will be together and fight terrorism uh, in a more uh, tangible manner. Uh, tangible manner in, means in terms of the peace that we all seek and in terms of the action that will give us the right results. Right. On that note, Ambassador Dali, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us on Indian Standard Pleasure. Time. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Well, that wraps up this episode of IST. Do join us again next week when we will speak to another guest. Thank you for watching.